today is February 1st, 2023, and we have a quorum present. Uh, we are going to start with uh, the second item on uh, the agenda in front of you, Senator Seeberger's Senate File Mr. 477. Mr. Senator Limmer? Just a quick procedural question. Yes, sir. Um, I noticed this Friday we have scheduled a number of issues, rather, rather big issues, and uh, I was just wondering, is it the intent of the chair to continue to schedule bill hearings on Fridays? Uh, yes, Senator Limmer, it is the intent to schedule bill hearings on Fridays. We'll try to start early if we can, and depending on how much is on the agenda, hopefully we can get done uh, comparatively early as well. But unfortunately, uh, we, we only have two meetings a week otherwise, and we have a very full uh, pipeline coming to this committee on an original and re-referrals. Yeah. So I think the only way we can try to get our work done this session is to do it that way. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we still have uh, the budget stuff coming to deal with as well. Yeah, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, I just wanted to bring that up because at least some, most of our members on this side of the table are uh, outstate senators, and uh, they usually reserve Fridays for uh, meeting constituents and other events, uh, which uh, when you have a number of hours traveling back and forth, it does kind of cut into their their weekend that we don't necessarily have to endure, but they do. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is: is um, usually in a in a system that we have, it's intended to go slow. Uh, uh, the governing and considering of legislation, and uh, we seem to be operating legislative wide on a very fast pace, and. Um, uh, you you have even admitted at times that when we don't do our work carefully in this committee, it, it ends up doing judiciary work on the Senate floor. And that's usually not the place we want to do it. So uh, I'm, I'm just a little concerned. I'm trying to avoid those late nights on the Senate floor myself. And so uh, I hope that we would uh, be able to just slow the pace a little bit. I don't know if that's in the cards or not, but... Uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm hearing it from lobbyists. I'm hearing it from reporters. They've never seen a pace like this ever before. And uh, I was just wondering if that's something that we will have to endure all the way to May, or is that something uh, just up front in the timetable? Uh, Senator, I, I share your concern. Um, and uh, um, there's a lot that's being moved to us very quickly and we want to try to strike the right balance of accommodating the number of bills that are coming our way, but still having time to do the job right. Uh, it's one reason I, I, I wanted to add committee time on Friday rather than try to pack things in on Mondays and Wednesdays. And I prefer to avoid the late nights, whether they're on the floor or they're in committee mm -hmm. as well uh, during the week. Uh, well, as, you, as so. you've witnessed, Mr. Chair, Mr. Uh, we, Weber, have, we have some new, very energetic members uh, in our caucus that uh, love to debate things, uh, well, much longer than I prefer, but uh, there's no way I can really stop them, so. Well, Sir Lemmer, we, I guess. <laughs> yeah, part of the issue, of course, becomes when we have sessions, especially on Mondays and sometimes on Wednesdays when we're, Wednesdays when we're not just moving uh, a paper through the process. Um, if those floor sessions run late, it runs right into our committee time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't have the luxury of staying the whole afternoon in committee because this room is used afterward. Yeah. Uh, so those long floor sessions that deal with motions to re-refer bills from one committee to another, and we spend a half hour, 45 minutes on that, it cuts into our ability to get our work done in a timely fashion in committee as well. Right. Uh, so we're, we're trying to find the right balance. I, I share the concern that some of these things seem to be coming through pretty quickly. Um, and I want to respect that and uh, encourage members where you can, uh, when you're not in committee, use the time to sort of anticipate what might be coming so you can maybe prepare some of your due diligence before we get into committee and hear the presentations. And maybe we can all be a little more efficient that way when we're in committee. All right. But uh, thank you for raising those points, Senator. All right, uh, Senator Seeberger, Senate File 477. Go ahead and make your presentation. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm here on Senate File 477, which is a bill which prohibits retaliation against law enforcement officers who report or intercede in use of excessive force by other officers. And before I begin my presentation, I do have an am amendment, an A1 amendment. And Senator Seberger, this is the first committee for this bill, is that right? That's correct. All right, so this is an author's amendment. Senator Seberger moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Senator Seberger. Thank you. This bill um, comes around, uh, or comes about following some legislation that was passed in 2020, which imposed a duty to report and intercede in excessive force on the part of um, the police reform package following the murder of George Floyd. And after that legislation was passed, it became apparent that uh, officers who were acting under this duty needed some protection against retaliation for complying with this duty and, and, and in short, doing what's, what's right. So because officers have a duty to report any illegal use of force by another peace officer and the officer's chief law enforcement officer, um, this bill protects against retaliation and allows officers to feel safe in complying with that duty to report and intercede. Um, testifying here on behalf of this bill, I have retired St. Paul Police Officer Lucia Robluski. Officer, welcome to the committee. If you'd state your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lucia Robleski, and uh, I'm a retired St. Paul cop. Uh, I was on the street for 28 and a half years, um, working the Payne Phelan neighborhood, if any of you um, know that area. So very proud to have done that job. Um, if I may, I just want to, um, I, I would like to extend um, my thank you for all of you, for all of your public service, for being willing to represent um, the citizens of the state of Minnesota. Um, it's, I'm, it's just an honor to be here, but I wanted to thank all of you for your work. Okay, I better get down to it. Thank you. Go ahead and, and uh, <laughs> present your testimony then on Senate so File So I, I support this bill because cops, they need to know that they can call out bad behavior when they see it um, and, and not have any retaliation. Um, I guess the big, biggest example, I can tell you that Probably the most important job I did on the department that entire time was being a field training officer. I was an FTO for almost 24 years of my time. I was on SWAT too, if that impresses anybody. Um, and uh, I was a use of force and firearms instructor for the city of St. Paul for many years, honor guard. But one of the most important jobs I did was as a field training officer. And um, that job, you know, it depends on the department, it, it depends on the culture, but that job is very important and oftentimes it's not paid very well. Um, and when you, have, when you are inundated with a lot of recruits coming through, um, you know, I don't know how qualified some of the FTOs may be, um, but they are the leaders on the street. Uh, rookies, and I say rookies that are less than a year on the job, and particularly when they're in field training, um, you know, you, you, don't, um, you don't speak out, you don't tell your FTO that they're doing anything wrong. Um, you're trained to just learn, do, um, and stay quiet, generally. Um, and there's just this huge, uh, between FTOs and experienced officers, I mean, they're seen as the leader on the street. They're kind of seen as a boss. And if they're doing something wrong, it's very, very difficult um, for rookies to say anything unless they have, they've been told that they can be protected. Um, so that's just one example of why I think that this is very important. Um, and in conclusion, I support this bill and the work Senator Seberger has done to make police officers and everyone else safe. Thank you. Any questions uh, for Officer Robleski? All right. Thank you for your testimony. Um, members, I'll note that we do also have in our files a letter from the Center for Victims of Torture in support of the bill. 
Uh, Senator Seberger, anything else you have to present? or any, I should ask if there are any members of the audience that also wanted to testify on this. I don't see anyone coming forward. Senator Howie, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Lads and Senator Seberger. I got a question on what, and this uh, amendment brought it to light. But uh, now, when I look at uh, lines one fourteen and one fifteen, uh, and where the court may order the uh, law enforcement agency or the supervisor. Are we really going to ask the supervisor to, to pay those back wages, or are we really after the law enforcement agency? And I'm a little concerned that I, I don't know if we've ever done that before, where we've actually asked the supervisor of those folks to actually pay the back wages. Is that really the, the intent? Senator Seberger. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, um, the idea is to um, dovetail this and match this up with the with the prior legislation and to the extent that a law enforcement agency or a supervisor uh, um, kind of is is the one at the heart of the behavior then um, they should be held accountable now certainly just because they can be held accountable doesn't necessarily mean they will it's just simply a, a, a right of action and a remedy to include any person that um, is behind any kind of retaliation. Thank you, Chair Latz and Senator Seberger. Thank you for that that answer. But just because I'm the C, just because I'm the supervisor doesn't mean I'm I'm the person that either caused the action or in, is in the mix of this. Uh, and usually, uh, having worked many years in public safety. Those of us that are in that mix are, are I, can't even, I can't imagine they're, they've got the, uh, the wherewithal to, I, I can understand the employer. I'm a little bit weak on, on why we would go after the supervisor. I mean, if they're the cause of the action, that's a whole different, going down a different road that the, the court could take. But to, to go after the supervisor in a, in a case where they didn't actually do the threatening or the retaliation or didn't do the action. I, I think it's I I think it's a little heavy handed to go after the the supervisor and I don't know if I I think it's gonna really deter a lot of people from taking that position. Uh, because now you're opening yourself up to liability for actions of others uh, that you don't have may or may not have uh, having been uh, somebody that has uh, supervised in for individuals in combat, you don't always have your, uh, they're not always in within arm's reach or in direct supervision. So I, I find it, I, I just think that that's possibly something that you may need to take another look at because I'm, I'm pretty uncomfortable in voting for something that's actually going to happen or possibly order a person to pay for something that they had nothing to do with. So that's my concern. Thank you. Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Seberger, so I don't practice civil law, and I think that you do. So maybe you could answer this question for me. My understanding about this bill is that if th that a, a cause of action could be brought forward against the, the individual or the agency that engaged in the retaliation. Is that correct? Senator Sieber. Mr. Chair, Senator Westland, that's correct. And simply because somebody can be uh, named as a defendant doesn't mean that they will be named as a defendant or it doesn't mean that they would be held liable for any activity. And in fact, uh, even if a supervisor were not uh, specifically provided for in this bill under principles of respondeat superior, they could also they could be included in uh, a lawsuit anyway. So um, I too work in public service. I'm a paramedic. I have undergone field training. Um, I have been in the situation uh, where I am subjugated to supervisors and field training officers and certainly can recognize that those folks can play a role um, in uh, keeping people quiet. 
so I think it's entirely appropriate that supervisors um, and anybody who could potentially retaliate be a part of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess, again, I, I, I support the intent of this. I'm just wondering, in this context that we're just talking about employers and supervisors, isn't there a little bit of redundancy there? I mean, isn't a supervisor in that context considered an employer? Senator Sieber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, Senator um, they certainly could be, and this would be a factual determination and perhaps a legal determination that would need to be made under the facts of the case um, in any action that would be brought. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess my concern is that when you use two different words, courts are going to assume that they have different meanings. And my concern with this is that I think if you just had employer in there, that under law, under existing law, that would imply anybody above the person we're talking about would be, fall under that definition. If, by inserting supervisor and employer, you're creating some confusion in the statute, in my opinion. And so I think, you know, because obviously what is an employer then? It doesn't necessarily mean to the CEO or the, or the police chief or whatever. Um, to be, you know, it's anybody above that person would be considered an employer in my view. So I'm just concerned with the redundancy and um, using two words when one will do, creating confusion. Um, Senator Seaberger, could I get a little clarification? Um, on, I wasn't sure about your earlier testimony, probably because I was paying attention to some con conversation with counsel here at the same time. Um, did you say something to the effect that the underlying prohibition against retaliation sets up a specific uh, cause of action or liability against the supervisor as an individual rather than as an employee? Or did I misunderstand uh, uh, what you said? Mr. Chair, uh, if, I, if I said that, that's not what I meant. It's not in an individual capacity. It's in the capacity as a supervisor. Um, the intent being to um, protect those who comply with their duty to intercede or speak up from retaliation in the employment context. So I have a question for counsel, uh, uh, Ms. Primo. Um, the language on line eight, uh, when it says an employer or supervisor, um, is that language redundant? If the language just says employer, would that include any person in a supervisory capacity as well without <coughs> specifying supervisor in the bill? Mr. Chair and members, um, the or supervisor could be deleted and the intention of the bill to have the employer be held liable for actions of a supervisor would still remain. So, uh, Ms. Primo, would that apply then on line 8 and on line 14? Mr. Chair and members, um, yes, that's accurate. Paragraph B refers back to paragraph A, but the change, if that's the committee's intent, should be made in, in both spaces for, for clarity. So it, it sounds like perhaps deleting or supervisor on both 1.8 and 1.14. Yeah, yeah. I think we. Yeah, I think we'd have to refer back to the A1 amendment language. But, um, but then either way, um, if if a uh, an aggrieved party brought a civil action, um, and they named the uh, law enforcement agency. Um, <clears throat> they actually, without specific individual liability allowed under the statute, they wouldn't even name the individual supervisor as a defendant in a lawsuit, would they? Wouldn't they just typically name the employing agency? And uh, that would be it. No, the supervisor might be a witness in the case, might be the person that did all the bad behavior, but they'd be 
implicating the employer in that process. Is there any scenario under which that wouldn't be the case? I've asked a couple questions there, sorry. Mr. Chair and members, I think a, a, a supervisor could be named, but it would not be in their personal capacity. It, it would really be that the, the party liable would be the employer um, the, who the supervisor would have been acting on behalf of and, and within their scope of um, employment and their duties. Um, that, that's my understanding. Now, I know there is at least one analog in state law in the Human Rights Act where an individual can be named um, and be held liable in their individual capacity under certain circumstances. Uh, but that's the only one I'm aware of in state law. And there might be others. I just I practice in that area, so I'm more familiar with it. But um, un unless it's our in unless it's the intent to hold an individual responsible as an individual for out-of-pocket financial responsibility for their conduct, uh, and I'm not sure I'm comfortable doing that. Um, it's the, the employer would either way be covered, even if we deleted supervisor here. Is that, would you agree with that, Council? Mr. Chair and members, yes, I agree with that. Does the committee have, or, or the chief author have any uh, further thoughts on that? Mr. Chair, to the extent that it would make it clearer um, that responsibility really should lie with the law enforcement agency, um, I'd be okay with striking or supervisor from uh, line, page one, line eight, which would be 1.3 on the A1 amendment, and or supervisor on the end of 1.4 and 1.5. All right, uh, Senator Seabird, we'll have uh, the Senate Council here, uh, Mr. Backus, read that proposed amendment into the record then. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, that Senator Seaberger, Seaberger basically stated the amendment. It's technically it would be to the A1, which has been adopted because that's where the language appears now. On line 1.3 of the A1, delete delete that line essentially 1.3 or supervisor employed by a law enforcement agency, and then on line 1.4 to 1.5 of the A1, delete uh, or supervisor employed by a law enforcement agency. <laughs> Senator Seaberger, uh, would you like that to be your amendment? Yes, please. Yes, please. All right. Any further discussion on that amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Any further questions or discussion on Senate File 477? Not seeing any. Uh, so, Senator Seberger, uh, you move that uh, Senate File 477 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Senate floor? I do. All right. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Seberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Pappas, go to Senate File 34. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for bringing me back to complete this bill, um, which we've had, I think, plenty of discussion on. Um, you know, upon giving it further, t further thought, I agree with Senator Cohen that I think we should just delete Article 2, Section 1 on page 12. Um, I think the penalty section there is adequate, and if the rest of the committee agrees, I would move that. Am I moving too fast? I have another bill up in another committee, that's why. <laughs> We're just looking to see if we have this amendment in a written form. No, package, we don't. So you don't have the amendment. amendment. It's an oral amendment on my part. I'm sorry. All right, then would you please uh, repeat the amendment, Senator? Page 12, delete Article 2, Subdivision 2. I think it's the whole article. Let me just see. 
Am I wrong? Okay, it's a delete section one, subdivision two. I misspoke, I apologize. That's the section one, subdivision two, just, right. the, uh, just de delete section one of the amendment, which has the effect of deleting the, the amendments, the changes in the bill to subdivision two of that statute. Right, delete okay, section so one. So you're recommending to delete the penalty? Change. Uh, a change in there. All right. Um, is there any uh, discussion or questions regarding Senator Pappas's amendment? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Pappas, for that. It might save me an amendment that I was going to offer. Um, <laughs> Sorry to deprive you of that yeah. pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, can, you can move this amendment. I'm happy. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I'm wondering on, on uh, page 13, um, uh, Senator Cron, if, if this is not related to okay. the amendment I'll, I'll immediately for, before yeah. us, can you save that comment? I'll save that for later and just uh, thank Senator Pappas, and I'll limit my comments to that. All right. So any discussion relating Senator Pappas's amendment to delete Section 1 of Article 2 in the bill? <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Pappas, did you have any other amendments? Yes, Mr. Chairman, time? I have the A25 amendment. We'll come back to you, Senator Kroon, don't worry. Uh, all right, members, I think the A25 amendment is in the packets. Senator Pappas, go ahead and explain your amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is, um, except for the very deleting lines 19 to 21, this is, I think, a cleanup amendment by caucus, by Council, so maybe she could walk us through the amendment. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, um, as Senator Peppa said, um, line 1.13 of the A25 amendment is the only substantive piece that deletes the appropriation. The rest of the amendment uh, makes technical and clarifying changes. Uh, for example, it moves a defined term, um, public emergency, to the section that defines the terms that govern the earned um, sick and safe time leave uh, and makes other clarifying grammatical corrections. Uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer those. And Mr. Chairman, Senator after Pappas. our discussion during the last hearing about lines on page 16, lines 19 through 21, um, and upon consultation um, with the chair, it does seem like we should delete that language. Okay, so page 16, lines 19 to 21. All right, so uh, Senator Pappas is identifying the appropriation that is proposed in the bill uh, to the Supreme Court for purposes of covering some copying expenses and also adding a judge unit. Is that correct, Senator Pappas? That's correct. All right. Um, so our understanding then is, uh, I mean, this bill is going to move on to finance, um, and the judiciary will have an opportunity. I'm sorry, it's not going to go, well, eventually it will end up in finance. But uh, the judicial branch will have an opportunity to present their budget to us, and we will consider and decide how to handle their budget separately. But uh, those discussions will take place in a different context and we'll remove it from this bill. Is that the proposal, Senator Pappas? I believe so, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any questions or comments from members of the uh, committee on this? On the amendment uh, A25 as proposed by Senator Pappas. Anyone from the audience wish to uh, make any presentation regarding this amendment? Not seeing any, uh, all those in favor of the A25 amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Then, Mr. Right. Chairman, um, my motion is that Senate Bill 34 is amended be recommended to pass and re referred to the Finance Committee. Senator Pappas, before we consider that, we're going to turn back to Senator Kroon, who oh, I think sorry. had some other question or comment on the bill. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do appreciate the. Uh, the amendment on page 12. Um, I still do have concern over the penalty provisions uh, on page 13 um, regarding uh, the uh, violations, uh, the repeated and willful violations. So lines 
1325 through 1328. Um, I, I think the, um, the penalty of, of, of $1,000 um, per violation is sufficient in that context as well as what was on page 12, which was the, uh, the records provision. So I'd like to uh, offer the A23 amendment, Mr. Chair. Oh, excuse me. I, actually, it's going to have to be an oral amendment because the A23 amendment had the, the page 12 on it as well. So um, the written amendment I had prepared covered the one that Senator Pappas already addressed. So this one will have to be an oral amendment. So Senator Cruin, are you moving that uh, line 13.27 that the, uh, the new language be deleted and the original language be restored? I think a better way, Mr. Chair, would just be to delete section 3 altogether on page 13, so and that accomplishes the same purpose. And that's the only change in, uh, in section three. So yes, that would be my oral amendment. All right, so uh, Senator Cruin moves to delete section three of article two of Senate file 34. Uh, Senator Pappas, to the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I oppose the amendment. I think in this situation, you clearly have a situation where the employer has repeatedly or willfully violated a section of law. And I think it's appropriate then that the penalty is, and again, it's up to 10,000. It doesn't mean that the uh, commissioner will do that. And she stated at our last hearing that they, they do take into account the size of the business and what is the appropriate level of fine. You know, if it's a major corporation, obviously they'll do the 10,000. If it's a small mom and pop, Operation First, they'll try to resolve the issue by letter and discussion to see if there was an intention um, and if they understand the law. But we're talking about repeatedly and willfully, and I do think people need to be accountable if they're not following the law in regard to their workers. So I strongly oppose the amendment. Anyone from the audience wish to offer commentary on this? Any further discussion among members of the committee? Mr. Chairman, I'd like a roll call vote. Uh, there will be a roll call. Uh, so to the amendment uh, to delete uh, section three of article two of the bill, the uh, clerk will take the roll. Chair Latz? No. Senator Umover Baton? No. Senator Limmer? Yes. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Kroon? Yes. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Seeberger? No. Senator Westland? No. There being four in favor and six opposed, the amendment is not adopted. Um, I'm going to note before we go any further, at the conclusion of the last hearing on this bill, Rich Neumeister came up to me and indicated he had wanted to testify. So I guess I'll call the room out of uh, respect to Mr. Neumeister and see if he's here and wishes to offer any testimony on the bill. Is there any further discussion uh, on the bill? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Relating to the same um, part of the bill, um, I understand if, if the, the will of this committee is to increase uh, the penalties to up to $10,000 per violation rather than just 1,000, and that's what my previous amendment was uh, meant to address. But um, I still think that the bill as drafted is unclear <clears throat> in terms of when those violations start. Um, under the terms of the bill, it says repeatedly or willingly. So the commissioner must make a determination that there's a repeated or willful violation. But it's not clear to me once that determination has been made whether or not the fine, the, the, the instances that will lead to a fine start from that point forward or go retroactively to the beginning. And so I th I'm going to offer the A26 amendment to address that concern.
Members, the amendment is being distributed. Mr. Chair, I'll further explain once Senator everybody Clinton. has a copy. Yeah, let's put this in front of people first. All right, Senator Caron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the purpose of this amendment is twofold. One, to make it clear that the finable violations begin after notice by the commissioner has been sent to the employer um, to clear up that part of the statute. The second component is to limit uh, the violations uh, in total to $30,000. Um, I've already explained the first part of my amendment. The second part of my amendment, um, the limitation capped at $30,000, the, um, the employers that are going to be mostly affected um, by this change to the law are, are primarily going to be small businesses. They're going to be um, ma and pa operations, um, very few employees, um, perhaps not the means that the larger corporations have to um, address compliance issues and things of that nature. So I think having a cap on there, and I understand that the commissioner works with the employer and they take their size into consideration. Um, but all of those things are not in statute. And so I think it's important to have in the statute some mechanism to make sure that these employers um, uh, are not facing an existential threat um, over some of these issues. And so that is the purpose of, the, of capping uh, the fines at $30,000. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Senator Krum, can I ask you a question? about this on your 826 amendment um, on line 1.3 if we're going to line 28 on page 13 uh, it looks to me like the way it's written that there could be any number of willful or repeated violations prior to the issuance of a written notice that would go unaccounted for if the civil penalty is only applicable after the written notice is made. Am I reading that correct, Senator Cohn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, the, the purpose of the... Um the amendment in, in that regard is to make it clear that the violations the, that lead to f these penalties don't occur until the notice has been sent by the commissioner. That's correct. So, Senator Cruin, under that circumstance, in order to hold an employer accountable for repeated or willful violations, wouldn't that then require the commissioner to send such a letter out after the first repeat violation to every employer that fails to, uh, to comply twice or more, otherwise they wouldn't be able to apply any penalties on, you know, they might give an employer four or five times to repeatedly violate, then send them the notice and then the employer complies in the meantime They've delayed the process by however long, and there's no accountability at all for the first four or five violations because a notice had not yet been sent. Is, is, am I playing this out properly under your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't say there's no accountability. There's still the private cause of action, I believe, that the employee would have yeah. um, in a different part that has nothing to do with this amendment. I mean, in terms of the commissioner, its ability to hold the employer accountable for not complying with the requirements under the statute. Right, Mr. Chair. The, the alternative would be that once the letter is sent out, um, it would work retroactively to go back to the prior violations. And so I took the words of the commissioner to heart 
when she was talking about how they like to work with these small employers, try to get over some miscommunication issues. They send the notice, and um, at that point, that's when the fines would start. That is the purpose of the amendment. Um, and I think that that is uh, fair, particularly given the fact that we are now talking about $10,000 per employee per violation. I'm looking to protect these small businesses, many of which may have um, you know, limited understanding of how to navigate these issues. And so that letter from the commissioner puts them on notice <laughs> that the next one's gonna be $10,000, which in and of itself could put some of these employers out of business. So yes, I'm looking to put safeguards in here um, in the spirit of how the commissioner described the process to us at the last hearing, uh, that they like to work with the employers, they're not out to punish or putting any, anybody out of business, and so the purpose of this amendment would um, still allow the commissioner to do all of the same work, it's just that the fines wouldn't start until that notice went out. Uh, so I'm wondering if someone from the agency is here, the commissioner is here, could answer the question I have, which I would expect when there's a demand made by the commissioner for certain documentation that the letter, the initial letter would say, failure to comply with this could subject you to penalties for repeatedly or willfully violating the requirements of the statute. So my guess is the letter that this amendment would require would be a second notice to the employer that they could be penalized um, for not complying with the statute. Mr. I don't Chairman, know if there's anyone here, or Senator Pappas knows the answer. To that uh, Mr. Question. Chairman, I don't think there's anyone here from Dolly. I just <coughs> want to make a couple of comments that there are there are several other safeguards that are in current law and are proposed. Is one is there's a rulemaking process that the commission will go through to implement this part of her responsibility. That um, if there is a disagreement, there's um, a case can be made to an administrative law judge. And also in current law on lines 29 and 30 on page 13, it says that in determining the amount of civil penalty under this subdivision, the appropriateness of such penalty to the size of the employer's business and the gravity of the violation shall be considered. So I think those are adequate protections and I think it's, um, it gets to be a little, um, I think it complicates things to micromanage what the department does and what they're already doing. So I think the, the amendment is really unnecessary. I oppose it. And Senator Kroon, I'm concerned that the department would be in a position where they've got to send a notice out to everyone that misses a second submission um, and would actually substantially increase the amount of paperwork and bureaucracy that's required um, under the circumstances. Uh, and I can't imagine when they send out the request that they don't include in their request some notice that you may be subject to penalty if you don't comply. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If that notice is in the first, or if that language is in the first notice that they sent out, send out, that means that they've already, the commissioner has already identified a repeated or a willful violation. And if the first notice that they send out request for documents has that notice in there, then this amendment would apply and they would not need to send a second notice under your example. Actually, Senator Kroon, I'm not reading it that way because the way you've written it here, it says the notice that you're requiring has to identify each violation and repeated or willful violation. So an initial demand that says heads up in the future, if you don't comply, you could be subject to these penalties isn't going to have anything yet to identify. It would require a follow-up notice then after they have violated that says now we're going to punish you if you don't comply now, but we aren't gonna be able to punish you for all of your violations the three, four, or five times before after we sent you the first notice making the demand. Uh, Senator Caron? Yeah, and that, that is the intent of my, I, I, of my amendment, um, precisely, right. because otherwise, under the way it's current dra currently drafted, you know, unless if, if they do have specific instances of violation, they could put it in the first letter, but assuming they don't have that, and all the first letter is is a request for documents, then right, there would need to be a second letter notifying them of the willful and repeated nature of their violations that would invoke uh, finable offenses. So um, I guess what I'm trying to avoid is a situation where they send out the request for documents um, and then they go and get their documents. This isn't documents. Then they notify the person, by the way, we found uh, repeated violations, and by the way, there's three employees three 
to my example from last year, three employees, three instances, and all of a sudden, here's your $90,000 fine. I mean, that's the, that's the scenario I'm trying to avoid, a scenario um, that, quite frankly, will put all small businesses out of business with these massive fines. Now, if we reverted back to the $1,000 per employee per instant, then this amendment wouldn't be necessary and I wouldn't have this concern. But because we're talking about $10,000, that is the purpose of this amendment because those fines can escalate a hurry. And keep in mind, we're not talking about huge corporations here. We're, we're talking about small businesses and I'm looking for any possible way to protect these small businesses um, from these severe consequences that I see in the penalty provision here. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Um, at risk of repeating myself and what the commissioner said at our last hearing, on line 1329, 1328 through 1330, in determining the amount of a civil penalty under this subdivision, the appropriateness of such penalties that the size of the employer's business and the gravity of the violation shall be considered, not may be considered. I think Senator Kuhn, with all due respect, that is adequate protection for your small businesses. In so many cases, small businesses are part of organizations or associations that do updates, whether it's just by letter or, or webinars on what the new laws are. This will get plenty of publicity throughout the state. The commissioner is required to educate people across the state. We have funds for community organizations to educate people about this law. I mean, there are, I mean, there are other parts of the WISA bill we passed eight years ago that are ongoing education numbers like pregnancy accommodations. So this is just part of workplace safety, workplace laws that all businesses, if they're running a serious and, and legitimate business, they learn what these laws are. Senator Wesselin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Pappas. Uh, I want to see if I have this right, though. Let's, if we back up um, before we get to the to line 25. So I'm reading this in order because it seems to me to establish a process. So at the very beginning of the process, in the very beginning of this subdivision, it says if an employer is found to have violated the section. So there's been a finding. There's been a written finding and a determination. There's been an order to comply that's been issued. The commissioner has ordered the employer to cease and desist and ordered them to take uh, curative steps, uh, et cetera. And then after all of that happens, the next part in the, uh, of this section says, any employer who's found to have repeatedly violated. So there's already been a finding. There's been a demand to cease and desist. There's been a request to make curative action. And at that point, any further violations are intentional. They know now what they are supposed to do. Do I have that right, Senator? Yes, yeah, Senator Westland, that's correct. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But I'm looking at this as a small business, and I could get the first violation. I could be talking to my accountant, trying to figure this out, and my HR, and usually I am the HR, so usually, you know, you're, so you go to the accountant, and he says, and he's trying to figure it out. And of course, you got to get an appointment with those guys. And then by the time I can see, you can, get, you can get the notice that you're already in violation of three times before you actually figured out which end is up. And then you're, and I'm looking at 14.1, point, point, uh, you can get any, all the private, uh, the attorney general, all the attorneys engaged by the department, the administrative draw, and, you, and you're still trying to figure out exactly how it all works because we don't we don't occupy in this realm of uh, most of the small employers I know have to go through other folks to figure all this stuff out and by the time they try to figure it out I'm thinking they're already in past three deep and they're whether it's willful or not is because you ignored the conversation as you tried to figure this out. So I, I, I'm not comfortable with the guidelines that I see in place to prevent them from a huge bill at the end of the day when they're still trying to figure it out. 
Senator Howe, I'm, I'm looking at the bill here, and it refers back to subdivision four. So the, in subdivision seven, if you look at line 13.19, the employer liability only applies if there's a violation of subdivision four. So if you go back to 177.27 subdivision four, it's called compliance orders. And that is where the commissioner may issue an order requiring compliance with any number of statutes that uh, the Dolly Commissioner enforces. Um, and then the Commissioner shall issue an order requiring compliance. Um, and then a violation is repeated uh, only if the Commissioner issued an order to the employer for violation. Um, and the order is final, it looks like, at least for a certain section or segment of uh, the statute. I don't know if that's amended by this underlying bill or not to make sure this is covered. Um, but it sounds like any small business that gets an order from the Dolly Commissioner that says you're failing to comply with <coughs> lawful demands for records, and if you ignore that three or four times over, you shouldn't be in business. Well, if I may, Senator Latz. I've got three phone calls into Dolly right now talk, trying to talk to an issue, and they're all working from home, and I can't get a hold of anyone. So I can see where some of this might build up. And I'm a building official. I talk to these guys regularly. I've made three phone calls. I haven't heard from them yet. So as you may be not uh, complying, you may be trying to figure out the answer. And if they're not working and they don't answer the phone, and they don't answer the email, and you are trying to figure it out, just exactly where are you supposed to go? And in this day and age where we got all the electronics, but they're not working in an office where you can walk in and talk to someone, it puts the employer in a bad position, is what I'm trying to say. And I think we need to give the benefit of the doubt to the person trying to carry on business in this state, or we'll have fewer and fewer businesses. That's my point. Well, Senator Howe, I think under the statute, they've already got a lot of benefit of the doubt because there's a compliance order that has to be issued before they can be held in violation of anything in the first place. So adding another compliance order or notice on top of an already issued compliance order seems to be piling on the requirements that aren't going to accomplish anything further. Senator Westland had a follow-up on this, I believe. Just for, briefly, for Mr. Comment. Chair, and, and you know, we're talking about the, the, the right to have a review of decisions made by the commissioner as well, and in that same um, section four that uh, you noted, Mr. Chair, it discusses the fact that if an order mm -hmm. is issued, that the employer does have the opportunity to uh, contest the order and go through an administrative process. Um, again, this is the, the, the small business, and I'm a small business owner, so um, the business has been provided or an, an order that states you are not in compliance. And I don't think the intention of the statute is to unnecessarily punish people who are trying to do the right thing. I think it's very clear that it says it's trying to get to people who are willfully doing the wrong thing and who once they have been given a cease and desist order are being in, expected to comply with that order. And if there is a dispute about whether the order was issued, uh, the, the small business owner has the opportunity to go through a contested case process. Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I appreciate the conversation here and uh, Senator Wesson's comments. Um, primarily what I'm trying to do, and I think this amendment does it in a good way, but I understand um, how this movie's gonna play out. But I, I would just say what I'm trying to do here, and maybe there's some common ground, I'm not doing this as a gotcha amendment. I'm trying to provide some clarity to the employer because the way this is currently drafted, you talk about a process leading up to a cease and desist order, and then there's this further process. The way that this is currently drafted, 
the fines per violation per employee go back to all the way to the beginning prior to the cease and desist order. That's how this is drafted right now. And so maybe a, a compromise could be to Senator Westland's point, which is if you don't like my language and how this amendment is drafted, perhaps we could come up with an amendment that makes it clear that the up to $10,000 per violation per employee occurs after receiving the cease and desist letter, exactly to, to Senator Weston's point. And if this amendment fails, we could bring that amendment and make the bill better. Senator Weston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Senator Pappas, I would like to come back to you. So I'm new here. Um, my understanding is that we uh, provide this language, that we provide a new directive to the agency, and my understanding is that then the agency will go through a rulemaking process to determine how to implement this. And my understanding from your testimony earlier, Senator Pappas, is that once this uh, is adopted, assuming it is adopted, that the agency will then go through a robust process where they will have the ability on a much more granular level to determine how to implement this in a way that provides appropriate due process that makes sure everybody is clear in the expectations. Am I right on that, Senator? That's correct, Senator Wesley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Wesson. I appreciate that the commissioner does have rulemaking authority, but statute trumps rule. And if we want to make this clear that the employer should only be facing violations even after they receive the cease and desist orders, we ought to put it in statute. And we shouldn't rely on the commissioner to do that work in rulemaking. And so I, I like this amendment as drafted, but if, it, if it's voted down, then that will be my next amendment to make it clear that the violations don't go back to the very beginning but then only would occur after the employer receives the cease and desist letter. S Senator Curran, um, my suggestion, why don't you withdraw this amendment and just offer your other amendment and have us discuss that? <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, I, I, I need to amend an earlier comment that I made in consultation with counsel. Um, I thought there was a requirement that a subdivision for <clears throat> Uh, compliance order already be issued, but the reference in the statute that we're looking at here is just to the sections identified in subdivision four. It doesn't say the subdivision four compliance order has to have gone out first, uh, but it would be repeated or willfully, uh, willful violations of those sections in subdivision four. And subdivision four is amended on the top of page 13 in uh, section two of, the, of this uh, article to include the sections that are being addressed in this whole bill. So I just want to clarify my understanding for the record. Senator Howell. Thank that. you, uh, Chair Latz. I just would request a roll call on this there amendment. There'll be a roll call. Mr. Chairman, I oppose Senator the Pappas. amendment. I'm sorry? Mr. Chairman, I oppose the amendment. Senator Caroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I believe a roll call was requested. I was gonna do that. And then um, I, I like this amendment. Um, I would like a, a vote on my amendment as drafted, but in the event it fails, I will have a follow-up amend, uh, oral amendment. All right, the clerk will take a roll on uh, Senator Cruin's A26 amendment. Chair Latz? No. Senator Umover-Baton? No. Senator Limmer? Yes. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Kroon? Yes. Senator Pappas? Aye. No. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> I changed my vote to no. <laughs> Senator Seeberger? No. Senator Westland? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm moving this ahead to the final vote. <laughs> All right, there being four in favor and six opposed, the amendment is not adopted. Senator Caroon. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make this very brief. I appreciate the discussion. Uh, my oral amendment is um, after um, this, the end of the sentence, uh, the sentence ending an employee on line 13.28, um, adding um, occurring after the cease and desist letter required under this subdivision. And that, that way, Mr. Chair, that gets right to the heart of what we've been discussing here. It provides a point certain. It doesn't allow the employer to have uh, a whole host of uh, violations. It doesn't require multiple notices. It just makes it clear when the fines are going to start. And there's one note. You get the cease and desist. That's when it starts. So the employer doesn't have to worry about it going back to the beginning of time and in the investigation. And I think that is a reasonable compromise that gets right to the heart of the matter and, the, and uh, the discussion that we've been having today. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, council has a suggestion for that, Senator Crone. Um, Mr. Chair and members, um, I think this is still in line with Senator Cruen's um, amendment, but um, I would propose um, page 13, line 28, after the period, insert, for purposes of this subdivision, a repeated violation occurs after the issuance of a, of a cease or desist order. And, and just to clarify, actually, Senator Crone, you wanted a repeated or willful violation to occur after the cease or desist order is issued, correct? Okay. Senator Crone. I think it's stated much better than my amendment, and I'd like to make that my oral amendment. Mr. Chairman. Senator Pappas. Well, Mr. Chairman, that's better because it only applies to earn sick and safe time. Otherwise, your amendment would have applied to every other labor provision in law, which we don't know the ramifications of that. Um, Mr. Chair. Council, Ms. Primo. And members, I, I believe as, as I read the amendment, it would apply to more than just earn sick and safe time because this is a section 177.27 governs, um, you know, generally how the Department of Labor and Industry Okay, thank you for, for clarifying that. Then, um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Kuhn, I'm sorry, but that just impacts too many other labor laws that we don't know exactly what the impact would be, and I just can't accept that amendment then at this time without having that information. So, uh, uh, Ms. Primo, uh, then what you're, you're saying is that as written or as proposed, the amendment, because it's in subdivision 7, which at the beginning of it refers back to a section identified in subdivision four, which members have in their bill here. If you go back to the bottom of page 12, subdivision four of that statute is reproduced. And there is a long list of statutory sections there that continues on to the top of page 13, to which is added the earn sick and safe time, the new proposed earn sick and safe time statute sections. but. Uh, that's at the end of a long list, or with any rule promulgated. Um, so yeah, it sounds like the proposed amendment would apply to quite a long list of existing labor laws. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also, also note the increase from $1,000 to $10,000 applies to all of those same instances right. that you just referred. So if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. I've seen these, this kind of language also throughout statute, and it's bad drafting, it's bad law no matter where it's found. You got to have a point in time so the employer knows when these violations and when these fines are going to start. So just because this refers to other points in law doesn't create a doomsday scenario. It just happens to clean up other parts of law as well. Thank you.
Mr. Chairman, I think that this adopting this amendment would also send this bill back to the Labor Committee because it would be too broad to, and it's um, when it impacts all those other labor provisions. I was just conferring with counsel. It has to do with the powers and duties of the Commission of Labor and Industry. So it would be up to the chair of the Labor Committee whether they wish to bring the bill back to consider uh, this as well. Senator Howe. Thank you, Chair Latz. I'll request a roll call. There will be a roll call. Any further discussion? Senator Pappas, your position on the uh, proposed I oppose oral the amendment. amendment? Seeing no further discussion, uh, there being a roll call on this, uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Latz? No. Senator Umover Baton? No. Senator Limmer? Yes. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Kroon? Yes. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Seeberger? No. Senator Westland? No. Now, there being four yeses and six noes, the amendment is not adopted. Is there any further discussion on Senate File 34 as amended? I still don't see Mr. Neumeister here, so he's missed his opportunity today. Apologies that we couldn't get to him at the hearing on Monday. And Mr. Chairman, he told me there, there was an issue or a clarification, but we didn't get into a, a long discussion about it on, in terms of data privacy, so I'm not really sure what the issue was. All right, it seemed uh, fairly uh, simple, though, so if the chair, right. uh, he, well, you know, I can bring it to you and tell you what it yeah, is. No, if Mr. Neumeister wishes to communicate with the members of the committee or the chief author, he's, of course, free to do that. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Senator Pappas moves that Senate File 34 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Thank you. Senator Westland, Senate File 259. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I, would, I would like to move uh, Senate File 259. Senator Westland, why don't you go ahead and make your presentation and explain the bill. Thank you. Um, well, hopefully this will be a little uh, simpler than the last one we were on. This is basically a technical housekeeping uh, bill that has been proposed, and we do have um, someone here to explain the details of it because she's the expert. Um, basically, there are a number of provisions in the statute that are clearing up some language um, regarding real property and recording uh, and some modifications, um, m very minor changes. You'll notice in a number of places we're inserting or changing it to Minnesota Extension Service, which comports with the current uh, name of the agency. Um, in the sections regarding mediation, in the past, it's been my understanding that this has um, permitted or suggested that county recorders or extension offices might have or could provide forms for mediation requests. This is centralizing this so that it's the director of Minnesota Extension Services that is providing those forms and, and to whom the request for mediation will be made. Uh, there is a section here um, 
that actually falls within my area of practice, so I appreciated that. Uh, the summary real estate disposition judgment is um, issued uh, in conjunction with a dissolution proceeding where one of the parties is being awarded the homestead. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, that summary real estate disposition judgment does not get filed for whatever reason. Someone goes to sell their house and they realize they've got an, an issue. What this is doing is it's it's indicating that the court must require uh, that one of, one or other of the parties or their counsel prepare that document um, and make sure that that is recorded. It also alleviates responsibility of the recorder or the registrar to verify whether or not the court has actually signed off and approved a summary real estate disposition judgment. Um, and I think those are the primary points, but I... <laughs> I would defer to um, Ms. Schreiner to provide some additional information about what the technical corrections do. Ms. Schreiner, welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your full name and position for the record. And Thank testimony. you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Mary Schreiner. I am the recorder of Brown County, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Minnesota County Recorders Association. Uh, I am the co-chair of the legislative committee and the uh, chair of the Housekeeping Committee. Um, as Senator Westland, she explained those things great. Um, really, the other things are very um, just technical changes. Um, we took away um, in um, in the record um, Statute 600.23, um, the recorders and court administrators. We took out court administrators from the heading. Um, that was done when the statute was amended years ago, but they forgot to take it out of the heading. So we're just striking that at this time to conform. Um, and then we're also, um, it, it, we're kind of like a safety deposit box at this point. People can come and present documents to us and we can s hold them in safekeeping that have nothing to do with real estate. Um, so we're just, we're just switching the language and making it a little bit permissive, what we can accept if we so choose. And then also going on and um, limiting and, um, and explaining how to dispose of it after so many years um, so that much of what we have um, after so many years, and we've had some of these things for hundreds of years, and um, it hasn't been touched since. And we can preserve it. Um, some of it can go um, to historical society, but we just need a way uh, to make it that we can um, dispose of it or properly dispose of it or return it to its rightful owner. Um, so that amendment goes along um, and defines how we can do that. The other one I'll touch on is the Torrance property, um, the certificate of titles. Prior, uh, prior we had to actually have the owner's duplicate certificate of title. And they actually had to present that to us so that we could actually transfer the title. Um, that is no longer the case. Everything now is computerized. And um, so really we get the documents electronically. So it's really, um, there's no way to give them their, their owner's duplicate copy other than to email it to them after the fact. But um, typically when you return the document to them, that's when you gave them their, their copy. So when they file their documents electronically, there's no way to give them their copy other than added steps down the line. And we do do that if they request it, um, but we're just tweaking the language in the um, statute so that if they do request it, we'll, get, we'll provide that to them. Um, but prior to that, it's saying we had to provide it to them every transfer. Um, oftentimes, by the time they get that initial copy, it's already outdated as 
documents have already been filed by the time they get it. So um, we're just making that in line with what the, the private uh, or what the practice of our office has become. So we're just moder moder modernizing the statutes to be in line with what our current practice is. Um, so I'm here to support the, that the Senate file 259. Uh, the goal is to update and modernize those statutes and bring them in line with the practice and procedures of today's county offices. These changes are non-controversial um, and the intent behind them is to make, um, to bring some conformity and uniformity from county to county. Um, I ask that you support this bill as it will clarify and update the statutes and allow the county recorder's offices to run more efficiently and effectively. I thank you for the opportunity for me to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Schwann. <laughs> Any questions by members of the committee? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Directing your attention to 614 and 615, the summary dispositions of real estate. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, um, the purpose for why this needed to be put into statute, um, who was suggesting that it was the recorders or registrars of title responsibility to determine whether or not the summary disposition was approved by the court? Ms. Schreiner. It actually, um, it wasn't, it wasn't clear. Um, in the statute, it stated that if there was a summary real estate disposition, disposition judgment, that that is what should be filed. But it wasn't clear if we were to make the determination if one was or who was to make that determination. So we're just clarifying that it's not our job that we would file what was presented to us. Senator Cron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with that, and I like the language in here. I would just make a comment that um, regardless of what may be in the family law statutes uh, or the suggestions of certain people in the, these situations, it's not the county recorder's job to determine whether or not. And I guess it is, and this is just specifically saying that, so I, I support yeah. the language, but um, I saw that all too often in other contexts where um, sometimes it was the county recorders themselves wanting to assert themselves as the gatekeeper, mm -hmm. and that is inappropriate as well, whether it's a party trying to impose that on the county recorder or the county recorder trying to impose that on parties or the public. That's not their role. Uh, now, the registrar is a little bit different because sometimes they do have an enhanced role in protecting their certificate of title, but a uh, county recorder's job is not to be the gatekeeper. Uh, they are to record. Uh, as long as it's in recordable form uh, per the statutes, they should record it. So uh, I think this shouldn't be necessary, but unfortunately it is, and so I support the language. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Ms. Schreiner. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, we have had a number of occasions, um, particularly now with electronic recording, um, where we have been presented with the summary real estate judgments, and later that day or the next day, we are presented with the judgments and decrees. Um, so it, it goes hand in hand, and that's where this language has come into play. Um, so it's not so much where we're requesting it, it's just clarifying that we don't have to ask the question. Thank you. Senator Howe. Thank you, Chair Latz. And, and the question I have, and I don't care who can answer it, but how did the 20 years on line 1027, as far as the disposition of, of records, uh, how, how, where did the 20 years come from as far as disposing of those records? Okay. Ms. Schreiner. Mr. Chair, members, um, we had a discussion on this. Um, initially, we had talked with the Historical Society who wanted no part in taking um, many of uh, the documents we were talking about. Um, and then we had reached out to the county boards and 
just kind of had a survey of what the retention policies were with some of the documents that they had on file, and most of them ran 20 years. Um, so that's where we chose that number because most of what we were going to follow was the county's retention policy. Follow up, Senator. Thank you, uh, Senator Latz. Uh, the question, the concern I have is, mm -hmm. for especially in the time when we we are looking at finding uh, documents to be able to get a real ID or a, an enhanced mm -hmm. ID, many folks now have to go out and get divorce papers. Mm -hmm marriage licenses, change of names, and sometimes many of those are past 20 years. Yes. Uh, I have gr grave concern that we're going to, the only place where we recorded those documents are at the county recorder's office, and now 20 years, some of these folks have been married, like myself, 38 years. Now that document doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I've got grave concerns of that. The other piece of that is I've also got a number of DD-214s, so I'm discharge papers that prove that I served honorably and was discharged properly. Uh, and if I want to file for a, uh, some type of claim that the legislature provides me for, or I have to prove that I served in a certain conflict to get access to the VA, mm -hmm. the only place I recorded that is at the recorder's office. Now, that was my first time in a combat zone was well over 40 years ago. So yes. if it doesn't exist anymore, where do I go to find that document? Ms. Schreier. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, these are really two separate things. So our vitals and our real estate records, our discharge, um, those are all kept forever. Those are preserved. Um, they are not disposed of ever. Um, and really, all our documents now are kept and preserved electronically. Um, everything prior to that, um, that are prior to the electronic digital image, uh, we do maintain and keep the original documents. The documents that um, are talked about here are just documents that are presented to us for safekeeping. Um, some people brought to us um, wills. Some people brought, um, say, like our Brown County Egg Society brought their annual reports to keep in our vault for safekeeping. Um, those are the documents we're talking about. Now, we have since digitized them, so we do have a digital copy of them, but we still have the hard copy. And that's what we're talking about now, the 20 years. Can we get rid of that hard copy now? Can we dispose of that? So it's not any kind of um, document that we are by law bound to keep. These are all extra, like safe deposit type box. I was just going to say, Senator Wilson. Mr. Chair, um, uh, it's sort of, it, it's in lieu of somebody going to their bank and getting a safe deposit box. Uh, I was completely unaware of the fact that you could go to your county recorder and say, could you could you hang on to this for me? So was I until now. Yeah, <laughs> so so that's basically what it is, is, is saying that the county um, may receive the documents instead of that they must, and then also uh, if they're going to be acting as a safe deposit box, that it has some uh, end period for them. Mm -hmm. Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Chair Latz. So where does it determine which and, and let us know what documents are kept permanently and what are just kept for 20 years and thrown away? How, do, how, does, how does someone like me or someone else know mm -hmm. where, what's what and where is it? When are we going to be not be able to get that document? Ms. Schreiner. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, those, those birth certificates are dealt with in another statute. Um, the death certificates are dealt with by another statute. Uh, real estate records are dealt with under a different statute. They're all dealt with under different laws. So if I may, uh, Chair Latt, so Senator it's the 600.23 that di dictates a different section of, it, it of what is requir required to be kept? Ms. Yes. Schreiner. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, 
that kind of captures everything else not covered by any other statute, essentially. I just wish it was clearer. Senator I do. Thanks. <laughs> Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, usually, um, when we get into title legislation, I usually hear some kind of word from uh, the Minnesota Bar Association. They have a very active real estate uh, section. Have they had any participation in this legislation? Ms. Schreiner. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, we have um, sent this to the Real Estate Committee. Um, we have sent this to, um, now I'm put on the spot and I can't recall, but we have sent this to various committees um, to take a look at and get feedback, um, the MSBA committee. Um, and we have sent out and gotten feedback and adjusted um, and so, yes, we have made contact with other um, other committees that have had some vetted interest in these. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lemmer. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I heard the answer clearly. Did the Bar Association participate in drafting this legislation, or at least correcting it, or giving suggestions that you adopted in the paperwork. Ms. Schreiner. Yes, they have. All right. Uh, I did have a few questions. Uh, take, for example, page 1011, 10.11. Um, uh, this is in the matter of offering receipts, and we're changing it uh, if, requ if required versus if requested. Could you tell me what the difference is, and why would we wait for the request, wouldn't it be something that it would just be normal to hand over at the time of the transaction or the visit? Ms. Schreiner. Mr. Chair, members, uh, that the documents which are offered for that purpose and if requested shall give the person depositing the same a receipt for? That's what you're asking? Right. Um, Why wouldn't we just automatically give someone a receipt for that for those right. elements? We would automatically give a receipt. Um, so if we back up, we changed in, in line 10.10, .10, we changed shall, shall to may. So we made it permissive so that we wouldn't have to accept these things. And so we just followed through and said, if we do accept them, um, then we will, um, if requested, give them a receipt for those things. Um, we just kind of followed through and made it permissive all the way to the end was our thought process. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I can bring you to another location, uh, a number of places you have removed reference, such as uh, line 710 and 323. You've removed or struck the language county recorders or ex county extension office. Mm -hmm. Uh, and relied simply on one location, the director of Minnesota Extension Service. Uh, I've always thought that a county recorder's office um, would be closer to the public in that immediate area. Why are we going down a centralized government path to go to one office uh, somewhere in the, I don't even know where the Minnesota Extension Service is, but mm -hmm. is, it, is it a singular address? Or, and why wouldn't we use a county organization? Ms. Schreiner. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, we, have, we dealt closely with uh, Mary Nell Priestler, who is the program director at the extension, um, Minnesota Extension Office. Uh, she's up in Duluth. And the county recorder's office has never had forms available in their office. Uh, we've always referred them to the extension office. 
there's, there's a notice that has to be provided to uh, the debtor. The recorder's office is not made aware of that notice. And so if they would come get those forms from our office and we would have those forms and give them to them, there's a potential for fraud um, and abuse that has been made in the past to those recorders that have given forms to them. Um, she was completely on board and suggested to us to remove the recorder's office completely from the statute. It was her recommendation um, upon the, our discussion with them. No, they're not available online. They have to get the packet directly from mm -hmm. them because they monitor what notice was given to whom so that the right debtor gets the right packet and it follows accordingly. So Ms. Schreiner, this, this applies specifically to a mediation that's going to be conducted Farmland by the director of the Minnesota Extension Service, right? Correct. So basically, you're requiring that they go to the mediator to get yes. the forms to ask for the mediation. Correct. They want to follow it through all the steps. Okay. Yes. Senator Limmer, did you have yeah. a follow-up? Uh, no, uh, but I do have another question. On lines 926, 927, uh, we're changing subtly the role of the director. Director shall provide mediation request forms when requested. Uh, when would the person know that they can request these forms mm -hmm. if they're not providing that information? Mm -hmm. Ms. Schreiner. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, when they receive that notice from the extension office, that is exactly set forth what they need to do, and that is where they know um, they need to get these forms from the extension office. So, Ms. Chairman, notice is provided, but in a different manner. Correct. All right. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion from members of the committee? <coughs> Seeing none, uh, Senator Westland moved that Senate File 259 uh, be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you. Senator Latz, you may begin. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for putting this bill on the agenda. <laughs> Senator Latz, you got it any time. Uh, Madam Chair and members, um, this, I initiated this bill a, a couple of years ago based on my own experience in the practice of law and um, Others, I think, had talked about it before I dropped a bill on the hopper, so I don't think I came up with the idea, but it had been pretty apparent that there was a value to it. The purpose of this bill is to address a misalignment between state and federal law. Specifically, our current definition of gross misdemeanor can be defined as a felony under federal immigration law in numerous circumstances due to a one-day discrepancy. The consequence of this felony conviction for immigration purposes is virtually automatic deportation, even for green card holders. Notably, a gross misdemeanor conviction could still lead to deportation. This proposed change simply aims to avoid a disproportionate result related to the particular offense. Now, practically speaking, Minnesota currently does not have full control over determining the intended consequences of behavior constituting a gross misdemeanor. But by changing the definition of gross misdemeanor by one day, 
we can ensure that these misdemeanor offenses carry with them misdemeanor level consequences that the state of Minnesota intends. Uh, the bill is supported by the Minnesota State Bar Association, Minnesota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, in addition, several county attorney's offices have weighed in to support the bill. Um, and so you can see from your enclosed materials, as has Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. Uh, to be specific, what the bill does is it changes the definition of gross misdemeanor crime in Minnesota from a maximum penalty of 365 days to a maximum penalty of 364 days. That's because under federal law, a felony is any uh, crime that is punishable um, by a year or more in jail, meaning 365 days or more, rather than more than a year, which is how Minnesota law defines felony. So to eliminate the risk of the disproportionate felony consequences under federal law from what Minnesota is defining as gross misdemeanor crimes, um, this bill would make the change from 365 to 364 in our definition of gross misdemeanor. Um, I do have um, an A1 amendment that I'd like to offer as an author's amendment as well, uh, which brings some clarity uh, to these definitions and also um, applies this change retroactively um, to existing gross misdemeanor convictions in Minnesota to avoid the exact same uh, disproportionate consequence. And it also uh, then uh, uh, allows, uh, grants the court the authority, if they need it from the legislature, to make changes um, appropriately under the court's rule 27.03. Um, I also have with me a testifier, uh, Mr. Chan, who is an immigration lawyer who would like to offer some thoughts. Senator Latz, would you like to offer the amendment first? I move the A1 amendment. Is it an author's amendment, Mr. Chan? Yes. Pardon me? Is All it an author's amendment? Author's it's an amendment, author's yes. amendment, yes. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that passes. And uh, you have a testifier who would like to speak to I do, Mr. Chan, well. who's sitting to my right. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chairman Latz and uh, members of this committee. Uh, my name is Linus Chan. I am an immigration lawyer that teaches at the University of Minnesota. I represent people held in immigration detention. Uh, I um, originally, uh, Julia Decker, who is the legislative director at the ACLU, was slated to testify. Unfortunately, she's unable to make it. Uh, she uh, sends her regards and asked if I could uh, an attempt to fill her shoes, if at all possible. I just want to emphasize that this particular one day mismatch is a source of extreme confusion, not only for people who are undergoing the criminal and immigration process, but it causes uh, a tremendous amount of confusion, time, and administrative burden on both the courts and the county attorneys uh, that are prosecuting some of these cases in order to make sure that when someone says that they have a misdemeanor, it actually continues to be a misdemeanor, even in immigration. I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, the committee might have. Uh, this can be a bit of a technical area of law, so I apologize, and please uh, you know, have me clarify any things that you need. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Chan. Uh, committee members, do you have any questions? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Latz, uh, you made mention that the uh, A1 amendment uh, recognizes a retroactivity on this. Uh, could you explain or maybe reveal the scope of what that would uh, would affect, uh, are there hundreds, thousands of people uh, that we're trying to address or is all of that, uh, there's gotta be a reason for it. Could you explain a little further? Senator or perhaps your testifier could. Yeah, uh, Madam Chairman, Senator Limmer, um, 
under Minnesota statute, um, a judge could sentence a person who is convicted of a gross misdemeanor up to 365 days in jail. Not every gross misdemeanor sentence specifies 365, but it could be. That's up to the, the judge, ultimately, who, who imposes the sentence. Um, that would apply. So this would apply to every gross misdemeanor conviction in existence in the state of Minnesota. Um, and uh, I presume it would also, well, going back as long as there have been gross misdemeanor sentences in Minnesota, it would be deemed as a matter of law to have been sentenced for 364 days instead of 365 days. So that would encompass U.S. citizens. It would encompass lawful residents of the U.S. and any others who have been convicted um, of a gross misdemeanor crime in Minnesota. Uh, so I couldn't tell you numbers. It'd be substantial numbers. Some subset of them um, are, if they're still here in Minnesota um, or in the United States, are vulnerable to federal action based upon the federal definition of felony uh, in, in, uh, in their laws. So, Madam Chair. Senator Lemmer. Uh, Senator Latz, uh, uh, what definition would Trump one over the other? Senator Latz. It should be, yeah, and this clarifies. But that's fine. But that we I'm sorry, I didn't hear what Senator Limmer asked if there was a follow-up question. Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Latz, what uh, jurisdiction would Trump over the other, the federal or the state uh, definition uh, on the number of days? Senator Latz. I suppose it depends on what jurisdiction there's a charge made or? Uh, no, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, uh, federal law takes precedence over Minnesota law. Um, if Minnesota, if under Minnesota law, a person is sentenced to 365 days in jail, typical sentence, they don't execute all 365. They're sentenced to 365. Of that, 20 days are executed. So they serve 20. They've got 345 days suspended or stayed during the period of probation. But the pronounced sentence is 365 days. That makes it a gross misdemeanor crime under state law. Under federal law, they will automatically treat that as a felony by the federal definition of their categories because of the way the state has defined our gross misdemeanor. Thank you. Senator Limmer, any follow-up? No. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And could staff give me uh, an example or a few lists of what constitute or what would qualify as a gross misdemeanor? What would I, what types of crimes do I do to fall into a gross misdemeanor? Council. <laughs> Madam Chair and Senator Howe, it, it's a huge list of offenses. Could, uh, it could be, say, a repeat DWI. It could be a fourth degree assault, like a, assaulting someone for a bias offense, things like that. There are hundreds and hundreds of gross misdemeanors. Madam Chair. Senator Latz. It could also be a theft in an amount that exceeds $500 as a threshold. So a theft of, a, <coughs> of anything that's valued at $500 or more is also a gross misdemeanor. Straw purchase of a firearm, Senator maybe? Howe. Uh, Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, yeah, I think a straw purchase is under current law a gross misdemeanor. I know there's a bill proposed to change that to a felony that uh, has been introduced, but under current law, I believe it's a gross misdemeanor. Senator Howe? Well, so it seems like the intent of the bill is to keep these folks from facing deportation in many cases uh, just to change a day. I guess with the types of crimes they're committing, I don't know why we'd want to stand in the way of that. Senator Latz. No, this is really, uh, Madam Chair, the, the collateral consequences are not specifically a subject of 
punishment in our criminal laws in Minnesota. Um, and this topic comes up in a lot of different contexts. Um, what we are trying to do with this bill is to align the collateral consequences that we're aware of with regard to gross misdemeanors with <coughs> Minnesota law rather than creating a situation where the collateral consequences under federal law could be far in excess of the severity of the offense as we've defined it in Minnesota as a gross misdemeanor offense rather than a felony. Senator Howe. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. But Senator Latz, the judges are well aware of this, are they not? I mean, and couldn't they not just make a practice to say 364? Why do we need to change law to make that? Why can't the judges are well aware and have full capability of, of uh, a, a uh, assigning someone less than 365 days for a sentence, they are, they are in control of that already, are they not? Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Howe, uh, ultimately a judge makes a sentencing decision. Most cases are resolved with an agreement between a prosecutor and the defendant or the defendant's counsel. Many prosecutors are willing to agree to sentence it at 364 days instead of 365. Many prosecutors are not. Prosecutors, the county attorneys anyway, who do most of the prosecution in the state are elected officials in their counties. And this becomes a political question for them, as frankly, as well as a uh, justice uh, uh, question uh, for them. Um, ultimately, a judge either rejects or consents to a proposed plea agreement. Um, and so, yeah, there's some discretion there. Uh, this proposal would remove that discretion and that point from the negotiations and would simply make the definition of gross misdemeanor. Senator Howe, any follow-up? Senator Limmer. Thank you. Uh, Senator Latz, um, so far we've framed this discussion uh, uh, around someone that would be prosecuted under gross misdemeanor that somehow is less of a criminal than someone else. Uh, if we take away that discretion, couldn't we <clears throat> be affecting the possible de avoiding deportation of, let's say, a really, uh, really serious criminal that's a threat to our people as well as themselves? So um, I've always kind of cited on the, on the side of discretion, judicial discretion, rather than putting a bright line. Uh, there are people that are very serious criminals that may uh, participate in a gross misdemeanor crime that uh, just their actions reflect the tendencies and the threat to the public. So uh, I'm a little, I'm trying to understand why would, why would we take away that discretion from a judge? Senator Watts. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Limmer, most judges, actually judges are technically prohibited from f factoring in collateral consequences on this. Now it can be negotiated and sometimes judges will go along with it or agree to it with kind of an understanding, but I think technically they are not allowed to factor in these collateral consequences. Um, nor do we want to turn every sentencing into a quasi-deportation hearing in which the defendant is arguing to a state court judge about what might or might not happen in a federal immigration proceeding for lawful residents of the United States, as well as undocumented or unlawful residents. Um, so it would turn every sentencing into a big hearing on collateral consequences, which is not really the purview of state district court judges. Um, and, uh, and as to immigration and deportation decisions, that's all within the federal government's purview and it's, it's their discretion and subject to federal law. There are, there are some federal statutes that mandate deport, deportation proceedings upon the commission of certain 
kinds of felonies and other kinds of felonies or even gross misdemeanors um, could result in mandatory or discretionary deportation actions by the federal government. Um, this simply removes the state from those proceedings and does not create a situation where there's an automatic federal felony where the state's intent is for the punishment of the crime to be a gross misdemeanor level offense. The difference of one day isn't going to make any difference in terms of the punitive nature or the, the sentence in Minnesota, but it could have a massive effect um, under federal law. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Chan has something to add, especially in response to Senator Howe's earlier question about uh, examples. Mr. Chan. Uh, yes, thank you. And Senator Limmer, I just wanted to highlight a couple aspects. As Senator uh, Latz had described, many times reducing a crime from uh, 365 to 364 doesn't necessarily take away elig complete eligibility for deportation. A person could still become eligible for deportation. In fact, what it does do is it restores that discretion to the immigration authorities that avoiding the phrase aggravated felony, and it's something I just want to highlight here, there is a big disconnect when someone is told in state court that what they have is a misdemeanor and then told rightfully so that what they have is a misdemeanor with misdemeanor punishments and then find themselves in immigration court and have everyone tell them, no, actually it's what's called an aggravated felony. And those aggravated felony sentences is what removes the discretion. So you talk about discretion and I think it's just important that this actually restores discretion <coughs> and makes that discretion part of the federal government and immigration judge's decision. As for uh, Senator Howe, I would say that while it would be, while I think many judges do know about the potential consequences of 365 versus 364, I personally have seen clients in which the, we have been able to successfully go back to state courts and let the judge know what that difference has meant, and then the state court would go ahead with usually an agreement from the prosecutor to not have such a, a draconian um, result. So just to answer the question, I think while I think many judges do know, there are still examples where judges may not. And, uh, the, the, and that there are even instances in which uh, it's not always clear what a person's immigration status is in front of the judge. People themselves may not know. And so that could be something as an area that can and use some uh, brighter, clearer lines. Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Latz. To amplify on that, um, many private criminal defense lawyers also do not know the significance of this difference. Um, many of them don't address the question in, in court. Um, the, uh, there's an advisory that is often read to criminal, def actually to all criminal defendants, that informs them they're depending on their status in the United States, there may be immigration consequences. Um, but uh, not every criminal defendant has the wherewithal to go consult separately with an immigration lawyer to figure this stuff out. Most criminal defense lawyers are not expert immigration lawyers. And frankly, there are a lot of people who resolve cases in court without attorneys representing them at all. They're unrepresented. They don't qualify financially for a public defender. They don't have the resources uh, to hire a private attorney. Um, and they end up resolving, they go talk to the prosecutor directly. It's not the prosecutor's job to sort those immigration potential consequences out for them. They're completely ignorant. They go in front of a judge and they just get the automatic gross misdemeanor sentence. Um, and uh, they find out sometime later when they get a notice from the federal government that they're the subject to immigration proceedings, maybe deportation proceedings. Uh, so there's a, frankly, there's a lot of ignorance in the system and the victims of that ignorance often end up being punished far in excess of what was intended by Minnesota, current Minnesota statute for gross misdemeanor consequences. Uh, I saw Senator Kroon and then I'll go to Senator Wesson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, perhaps this is just philosophical disagreements here. I don't know, I guess what I'm struggling with is whether um, certain criminal behavior is worthy of deportation seems to me to be a federal issue. And I'm struggling with why we need to change our definition of, of our state law 
to kind of circumvent the consequences of federal law. I mean, ultimately, that's what I'm struggling with as I'm listening to this. And it seems to me perhaps a better approach um, would be if, uh, to address this issue would be to, to lobby Congress to change the definition of an aggravated felony under federal deportation laws to not include sentences of 365 days. That would be a more direct way, it seems to me, to address this problem rather than kind of changing our definitions to kind of circumvent it. It's just a comment, not a question, but you can respond if you like. Thank you. Senator just, Lass, or Mr. Chan. Uh, I will say uh, that I think a lot of this confusion, unfortunately, is from the federal immigration uh, statute that was passed in 1996. And I will say that I would agree that it would be great if that happened. Unfortunately, many states are dealing with this particular issue because most states define gross misdemeanors and felonies this way. In fact, the federal criminal code defines it the same way as the uh, Minnesota's legislature. It's the immigration statute that has decided to go into that one day and call that into an aggravated felony. So I, I don't disagree that might be, but unfortunately, this is where we're at. Uh, and I don't know. Um, I, I think this is one way that can be very effective in making sure to let Congress know that this is something that needs to be changed. Uh, Madam Chair, I want to point out for the members that uh, there is a letter in the members' packets from the Justice Action Network in support of this change. Um, they identify themselves as the largest bipartisan criminal justice organization in the nation. Thank you, Senator Latz. And we're reaching the end of committee time, so I'm going to go to Senator Westland and then we'll wrap up. I will be brief, which is not often the case with lawyers. So just to bring this back to the nugget of what we're talking about here, one day, it's a de minimis change in the law. And what it's changing, as I understand it, is that someone will no longer be subjected to automatic deportation, but they could still be subject to deportation proceedings. Do I have that right? Yes. Senator Latz? Madam Chair, yes. Mr. Chen concurs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, Senator Carlson. Just one curious question, Madam Chair. Um, how does the federal government get notified of this sentence? Uh, is that automatic? Or is that something that they pick up through uh, some kind of uh, searches? Mr. Well, Chan? Uh, most sentences, once they're entered, are public record. And so once there is information, depending on how, but the federal government uses many different databases, including the FBI database uh, as well, to get information about someone that they may or may not be targeting. But in order to get that, they get it the same way most of the time as the public would in looking at the Minnesota public court records. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair, follow. Yes, Senator Carlson, briefly. So, yeah, so that means that uh, there is no automatic notification by the state court to the federal government of either the 365-day sentence or 364-day sentence. Mr. Chan. Uh, there have been previous practices, but there is no automatic notification, no. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Latz, would you like to speak to the bill? Uh, yes, just uh, a note that this has received broad bipartisan support across the legislature, and I ask for similar consideration here. Wonderful. Move, move Senate File 816 be recommended to pass and be... As amended. As amended and be referred to... Where does it go? Floor? Wonderful. Floor. Thank you, Senator Lutz. Uh, Senator Lutz moves that Senate file uh, 816 uh, uh, as amended be recommended to pass to the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. no. The motion passes. Oh, that's all we have. I can adjourn us? Yes. We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can uh, confuse you. Or, uh,